I don't like to judge people, but I just think he's no good, in my opinion. Nick Chason. I'm Acadia Einstein, and this is Strangeful Things. Unsolved and super complicated. Strangeful things. <laughs> Welcome back to Strangeful Things. I'm Acadia and I am here with Mel's. Hooray. And Shue. Shue. She made it rhyme with Shue. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, and I guess we should discuss the fact that that you got you had a flood, but you're alive. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm the reason that there was no show last week and I'm the reason that last week's show went out uh a little late. Don't That's worry about my that basement because got flooded. So his basement got flooded and it ruined his fly recording studio that he had set up. Yeah, my sweet setup. Sons of bitches. Like, yeah, it looked like freaking war games in my basement. Whereas <laughs> Mel's is relatively dry and safe. Yeah, except the <laughs> mountain's on fire. So I just had, it's extremely dry in my situation. <laughs> well, I, all I have is like half of my fucking state thinks that you can't wear masks because you'll get a fucking 5g chip in your head or some bullshit like that yeah and uh you'll get carbon dioxide poisoning or some bullshit (laughs) fucking idiots we should make a shirt that just says wear your mask asshole (laughs) yeah Lots of people have started posting things like, uh, oh, the uh, CDC just announced that they came out with this new thing that protects you 90% of the time. It's wearing a fucking mask. Ugh. Goddamn idiots. But isn't it funny, well, like, in every single thing that's fucked up that's going on in the world right now, it's the same people on the wrong side of every bit of it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well... <laughs> Last week, the beginning of the show was a little bit non-traditional, and we got some feedback, some of it good, some of it bad, and honestly, I have to say that I am pretty proud of everyone overall for the way they handled a bit of current affairs sprinkled in with our regular stuff, because people listening to this in the future will, A, not know that we missed a week because they'll all just be in a row, so Shuey's off the hook, (laughs) and B... We'll go, oh, this was done during all when this shit was happening. So we're kind of setting our, you know, date as to when this was actually a thing. Now, for the people that I warned ahead of time that I wasn't going to care if they got mad about it, I guess I should repeat, I do not care if you are mad about it. (laughs) Literally one person who I didn't even hear from yet who I was worried about, and that's because I know them personally. Everyone else has to learn that just because there's two sides to an issue does not mean that each one is equal and deserving of respect. I can respect a person and think their ideas are dumb as fuck. And if they say enough dumb ideas, I might stop respecting the person because they are dumb as fuck. But that hasn't happened, at least not yet. And that's with listeners. In my real life, it's happened like a million times. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, is it, 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 I don't know. It's just, it, oh, there's two sides to every story. Yes, there's also Nambla. So by saying there's two sides to everything, you're giving Nambla credit. You fucking you dimwits. Sides, a right side and a wrong side. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I just want to play devil's advocate. No, shut up. <laughs> so the only other thing I'm going to say about cops and how they have us like fuck nine ways to Sunday that doesn't have to do with the Jennings aid specifically is that you've probably heard people talking about qualified immunity lately. It's a crock of goddamn shit. And it says you can't sue cops or police departments for what they do to you, no matter how fucked up it is. 
Now, it's no big surprise why this law exists. It protects the powers that be from having to answer for their crimes. So if you don't want to focus your anger, if, if you want to focus your anger on something, focus it on that. Focus, focus it on making the if you don't do anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about that the cops love to say when talking about citizens apply to them. You want to see a municipality somehow get its shit together in about two seconds flat? Think about the Breonna Taylor wrongful death payout that will never happen because of qualified immunity. If they had that hanging over their heads, they were sure as fuck would have had officers trained a shit ton better than they are now. And out of all the stuff that's happened as a result of the protests so far, one state has gotten rid of qualified immunity. Colorado. Everybody else is hanging right onto it. Mm. So don't stop. Because one out of 50 isn't great, but it's better than none out of 50. Yeah. Anyway, see, this rant was way shorter than last week. (laughs) And now we can get back to the fucking misery of the Jennings 8. Because this story doesn't get any happier as we go. But as always, we'll do our best to make sure you get the information without wanting to jump down a fucking well while we do it. So, you guys got anything to add to my tiny mini rant? Yeah. No, I think your rant was right-sized for me. I agree. (laughs) I think it was perfection. It was (laughs) fun-sized. Fun size. I wouldn't say fun-sized, no. All right, well, that's fine. And I don't know why I remember... A kid in high school did a bit. I mean, ooh, I was in high school, and he's like, "Who thinks that's fun?" <laughs> <laughs> They're like the smallest candy bars. I'm like, well, you know what? That's a good. You you got a tight three seconds of comedy there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sick of listening to myself. So Mel's, how about you lend your melodic voice to the brief recap of what we learned last week? These past few weeks have been way too much for me. And not enough of you two. So stop being so fucking lazy, even though I'm the one that writes it all. So I guess it's up to me how much you say. Mm. Oh, that kind of blew up in my face. Anyway, actually, that's a good idea. Tweet me at Acadia and Mel's at Mel's Bells 84 and Chewy at Chewy Time. And tell us if we have the ratios right or if you want to hear more stories from Mel's and Chewy. Because that will stress them right the fuck out and make me lol. So let's try it. <laughs> I'll even send I will even send one of the strangeful things trading cards to you if you give us some feedback and that is not just a trick so that I can get your mailing address. Why well, what are you going to do if you have their address like sneak in their house and subscribe to the show on their many devices? <laughs> Yeah, like, Alexa, stop playing Strangeful Things. I mean, who programmed this? Who turned on my old Samsung Galaxy S5 and installed Podbean? (laughs) (laughs) Fucking whatever. That's the best marketing plan I've come up with, you fucking dinks. So, (laughs) Mel, Podbean. So, that's that's the funniest platform, I think. (laughs) Um, unless there's like a pod buddy or something like that, then I'm going to go with pod bean. So Mel's let's do the recap because there's a lot of names in this case and people need to be able to start their fucking murder boards with pictures and yarn right away. <laughs> okay. So we're in the town of Jennings, Louisiana, which sits in Jefferson Davis parish. Okay. Uh, the town is like almost exactly halfway be- between Houston, Texas and New Orleans, Louisiana. And is a logical stopping point for drug runners going between the two cities, of which there are, of course, many, right? Mm-hmm. The police force in town, which we will go into more detail in this episode, they have a history of bad behavior going back as far as the 1970s. So in May of 2005, the body of Loretta Chazon was found in a river. That was the beginning of what would be eight murders that ended in 2009. All the victims were young women between the ages of 17 and 30. They were all habitual drug users and sex workers, and not one of the cases has been solved despite there having been a task force assigned to what have been called the Jeff Davis Eight or as we're calling them on our show, the Jennings Eight, because fuck Jeff Davis. Fuck them. Hell yeah. (laughs) When we left off last week, we had learned that the last victim, Nicole Guillory, 
had told friends and family that she was afraid she would become one of the victims and said that it was not a serial killer, as the cops had suggested, but it was the cops themselves killing the women. All right. So to quote the Pacific Standard magazine, she was killed in August of 2009, the last of the Jeff Davis eight. Not long before her death, she told her mother, Barbara Guillory, not to bother with a cake for her birthday that year. Mama, it doesn't matter, recalled her mother to author and investigator Ethan Brown. I'm not going to be here. She also told Brown that Nicole had confided in her. It was the police who were killing those girls. That's fucked up. Yeah. Can you imagine? Mm -mm. Don't get me a fucking cake. No, that's I think that terrible. Even if even if I knew I was going to die, I would still ask for cake on the off chance that it didn't cake. <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh, even if there's only like a 1% chance, you got to take the chance for cake. Yeah. <laughs> What's the loss? They have cake and you're not around? Like, yeah. that's yeah, really exactly. good. It's delicious. <laughs> so the task force was created in 2008 after there had been, I think, six murders. And about a year before she was killed, they got a tip from someone who had reported that she had been told that Nicole felt she might be the next victim. And the task force never followed up on the lead. I A fucking year before she died, Mm-mm. she was worried about it. And that's just one example. We got plenty more. The general seediness of the South Side of Jennings and the sex and drug trade that dominated the lives of South Jennings residents was an open secret, and the cops looking the other way was not a surprise to anyone. But the sheer number of victims and the persistence of author Ethan Brown makes this something we can cover, because I sort of think that if he had not dug into it, nothing would be known about any of this. Just like the lead concerning Nicole Guillory, there would have just been a lot of pieces of information that didn't get followed up on, let alone tied together. Well, I think that's what's so fucking enraging about this whole thing. Like, we haven't even dug that deeply into anything yet. And it already seems like there's just a lot that law enforcement could be doing. Like, I know last week the thing about having the time to interview everyone in the town over the past 15 years, like, that was like a joke. But... It's still pretty shitty that there are zero leads in all this time. Yeah. So do you think that like if another agency came in and took all the info and went through it, they would even be able to do the things the task force could task force couldn't? I mean, like one thing we are learning with current events is that these badges tend to stick together, right? Uh, Yeah, but it's got to be easier to put away bad cops if you're not worried about anything coming back at you for doing it. Like, it isn't like the FBI gives a shit what the local cops think. At least that's the impression that I get from watching all those many cop shows. (laughs) Or Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. Because remember when Styling had to get all the local cops out of the room when she started on the case? Oh, yeah. The local cops hate the feds. All right. But well, according they, to the they info, put the lotion in the basket, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> and, she, and it wasn't the local cops that solved it; it was her. Exactly. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, according to the info I have, there was some federal connections on the task force, and to my knowledge, there's never been a formal request from the Jennings PD that the FBI come in. But I can't imagine who else would be on the fucking task force. DEA, maybe. But listen. The FBI site actually talks about task forces uh, on an FAQ page that only had one Q <laughs> question. <laughs> Do FBI agents work with state, local, or other law enforcement officers on, quote, task forces, unquote? Answer. Absolutely. And we consider it central to our success today. Task forces have proven to be a highly effective way for the FBI and federal, state, and local law enforcement to join together to address specific crime problems and national security threats. In law enforcement, concurrent jurisdiction may exist, where a crime may be a local, state, and federal violation all at the same time. Task forces typically focus on terrorism, organized crime, narcotics, gangs, bank robberies, kidnapping, and motor vehicle theft. See our Partnerships and Outreach webpage for more information. 
The FBI also works closely closely with the Director of National Intelligence and other U.S. intelligence agencies to gather and analyze intelligence on terrorism and other security threats. Well, it actually says that on their website. I mean, like, who besides you was looking for that information? <laughs> Probably some local detectives that are in over their heads and the bodies keep piling up. And every one of them has a Hulkamania headband. And on their fingers, up a bullet hole in their forehead. Did you just confess to being the Hulkamaniac? <laughs> That's a pretty good calling card. <laughs> Take your uh, the right victim had a. Take your <laughs> what right you mean, Gene? I love to kill. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> so, I'm looking back through the things that they, the task forces, focus on. Why is motor vehicle theft on the list, but murder isn't? Yeah, I mean, I never heard you say murder. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, I, it, but why motor vehicle theft? Oh, fuck, they stole a car. Well, you better get the FBI in here, quick. Mm. Like, all. that makes the least sense out of that whole spiel. Sure does. Well, you know what it is? I, I guarantee it. And it goes to what you said last week about laws and stuff like that. Like, they probably didn't have jurisdiction over things like that. And then there was probably some huge motor vehicle theft ring or something back, you know, whenever. And they said somebody needs to own this, and they ended up giving it to them. I went to- like a, <laughs> just like a random fucking thing from like like one thing probably caused it. I wonder when they decided that the license plates would be a good idea. <laughs> like when. Like- <laughs> Like when they first invented cars, there's no way there would have been license plates on them. You know what I mean? Because there would have been one car in each town. Oh, yeah, that's Mr. Got Rock's car. (laughs) Everyone knows that. (laughs) And then later on, well, we could paint them different colors. That would tell us who is it. No. And then some guy invented the license plate, didn't get a dime for it. Yeah, yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. That's not really episode worthy. But if anybody out there listening knows who invented the license plate, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> so since there's so much to this case, I'm going to point out some important people so that we can keep track of them later. And I hope that that makes sense because I'm doing it either way. <laughs> Frank, I got it was more just telling than suggestion. But you know what? I, I can only do what I can do. So Frankie Richard is the first scumbag to discuss. He's been named as an oil rig worker, a strip joint owner, owner and an outright pimp. Huh. Now I will read a quote from the man himself to start us off. <laughs> My most memorable way of making a living was selling pussy. We sold pussy any and every fucking way we could. I did not pimp them girls. I introduced them to older men that wanted to spend some money on a young gal. I am making sure they are getting their money and making sure they are not getting hurt. I wonder if he knows what a pimp does, because he just did a fuck of a good job describing (laughs) it while saying that wasn't what he was. What a douchebag. Is that like actually taken out of, yeah, is that actually taken out of the dictionary? Like, that seems like a pretty good definition of pimp. I am not a ship captain. I just sit at the top of the boat and drive it and tell everybody what to do. (laughs) So right off the bat, this guy is a winner. Yeah. Yeah. He also, not for nothing, kind of looked and sounded like my Uncle Jack. (laughs) Who... who, (laughs) Oh, God. who, Who was in Maine, so... This, and and died a long time ago, so there's no way they could be the same person, but he, oh, he did remind me of him. So, according to Richard, we shared something. When we were at the lowest point of our life and no one wanted to have anything to do with us, we had something to do with each other. And that means something to me. Them girls were my friends no matter how fucking low my life was. And I was their friend no matter how fucking low their life was. And according to his niece, Hannah Connor. Uncle Frankie was like the guy you didn't want to mess with. You know, he took care of business. So, Frankie Richard in the documentary 
looked more than a little strung out. And if he had any teeth, they were on a necklace or some shit because they sure as fuck weren't in his head. But <laughs> he said more than once that he had nothing to do with the murders and that the women were killed because of what they knew. And in another quote from Ethan Brown's original medium post, because he couldn't this this author, Ethan Brown, couldn't get any traction on the story. So he just posted it on medium, which I guess pays for store. I don't know how the fuck medium works. Hmm. Well, regardless, Richard described Jennings when the killings began. It was wide open. The drugs, the prostitution, the bars, the crooked cops. Since the early 1990s, there have been nearly 20 unsolved homicides, including the slain eight women in Jefferson Davis Parish, a statistic in a competent sheriff's department that would be regarded as both a ridiculously low clearance rate and an astonishingly high murder rate for such a small area. And this guy was arrested for one of the murders, right? Yep. And so was Hannah Connor. The niece from the quote that you read. What? Who, yeah. They were charged with the killing of Chris and Gary Lopez, the third victim. The charges were dropped, though, when witness statements contradicted each other and an important piece of evidence was mishandled. Mm. Remember how long it took them to test the porch for blood? Mm. How good they are with evidence? Yeah. Yeah. And that whole thing with the the evidence being mishandled is going to come up again, so tack that to your murder board. <laughs> At any rate, Frankie Richard was a skid. I say was because he died earlier this year, who ran in some skid circles. And he was apparently writing a book when he died, so now we'll never know what else he knew, which is safe to assume was a lot. Oh, and while we're talking about charges getting dropped, it seemed to happen an awful lot. There's a thing called nole prosequi, which means a formal notice of abandonment by a plaintiff or prosecutor of all or part of a suit or action. That happened with Nicole Guillory a lot. Why? Well, we'll find out. So we are putting Richard in like the bad guy column, right? Oh, solidly in the bad guy column. Yeah, 100 percent. He's a fucking skid. (laughs) So then now we can talk about Warren Gary. He's connected to Richard and the third victim, the one Richard was picked up for doing. More than one person had told the cops that Richard and his niece had beaten Miss Lopez to death. Hmm. But there was another thing they talked about. There was a truck involved. Remember how I had said Richard got off because of evidence being mishandled? Right. According to the inmates being interviewed, Richard put the body in a barrel and put the barrel in a truck to transport it to where it was dumped. It was found in a canal, you may recall. The witness then said that the truck and whatever DNA that was in it had been purchased by a cop named Warren Gary. And here is the transcript of the interview with the inmates. So uh, you're saying that this officer knew about the DNA? Yes, sir. Did Hannah say that? Yes, sir. Did he know about the killing? Yes, sir, because him and Frankie Richard were good friends. What did Hannah tell you about the officer? That him and her uncle Frankie are good friends and that he bought the truck so that the evidence wouldn't come back to her uncle Frankie. He Mm. discarded it. He cleaned the truck at the car wash. Who cleaned it at the car wash? Oh, Officer Warren. What car wash did he clean it at? Ray's. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautifully done. (laughs) That that really was. Uh, Thank you. Thank Thank you, everybody. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. I hope everybody was was thrilled with that reenactment. That also, the, for some reason, I left in the part where it was Ray's car wash, just besmirching <laughs> poor Ray's car wash. It oh, Ray. that. And the climactic Ray's. <laughs> Ray is all mad, like, son of a bitch, and now everyone's going to go to Smiley's car wash. <laughs> I'm going to go out of business. <laughs> so we have potential evidence being sold to a cop. The 2006 Silverado was bought for 8700 bucks, cleaned, and then flipped by this officer, Warren Gary, and sold for over fifteen k. I I guess the value goes up when there isn't any murder evidence in it anymore. <laughs> so 
Gary got fined ten thousand dollars by the Louisiana Board of Ethics for buying a truck off a fucking inmate. But everyone on the cop side swears that he had no idea it may have been involved in a crime. <laughs> now, the crook he bought it from was a friend of Richard named Connie Slyer. Slyer was known to have been one of the last people to see Lopez alive. Ooh. And another cop, Paula Guillory, told Ethan Brown, quote, we knew that Connie Siler's, uh, Slyer's video was probably involved. Now, Connie Guillory's husband, Terry, brokered the truck deal between Slyer and Officer Gary. Terry Guillory was the fucking warden in the county jail where all these gals had been locked up at one point or the other. And we'll get to Terry in a little bit. Suffice to say that he is involved. And uh, Officer Gary, the guy that got fined the $10,000 for fucking with evidence, he was later put in charge of the police evidence room. I swear to fucking God. Uh-uh. <laughs> yep. Now, are these Guillories all related? Yes. Okay, because one of the victim is Nicole. Nicole Guillory, Guillory the last victim, um, was I believe the cousin of okay. Terry Guillory. Okay. All right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all. They're all. It's all fucking connected. There's a lot of and myths this here. whole fucking thing. It's like this is like like a million seventies movies about the South. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's kind of funny that you say that because I know that there are other cases that have claimed to be this, but the Jennings Eight can make a strong case for itself being the at least one of the things that the first season of True Detective on HBO was based on. Oh, really? Yeah. Because nice. remember, that was a bunch of young girls getting killed in the in Louisiana. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's that's how you fail upwards. Yeah. You you fuck with evidence, and then you get put in charge of the evidence. <laughs> evidence. So. In 2009, Paula Guillory, mentioned earlier, was part of a raid on Frankie Richard's mother's house. His mother. This is how, this is what skids they are. His mother's house. (laughs) Richard, his mom, and Teresa Gary, the mother of the seventh victim, Brittany Gary, were all arrested. But when it came time to turn in the evidence... More than 4,000 bucks was missing. So instead of busting them all for drugs and guns and jewelry and even rare fucking coins that they somehow had, the charges again collapsed. Rare coins? Yeah, I guess they found somebody had a fucking Susan B. Anthony doll stuck to the (laughs) to a bag of weed. I don't know. Um, (laughs) I mean, I'm waiting for you to say there were gold bars, too. Probably. Um, Now, Guillory got fired for that, but she still insists she's innocent. But you know who helped her log the evidence? It was Warren Gary, officer pickup truck. Lord. So I think another thing that bugs me about how involved in all this the police seem to be is the Boudreaux Inn, hub of a drug and sex trade that had the cops there all the time. So Ethan Brown had pulled like all the police reports like in the town. And according to him, the address of the motel and bar had appeared on a ton of them associated with the victims in which they were the accused, sex work, drug use, etc. Now, we said earlier that things were an open secret in Jennings, but the Boudreaux Inn sort of pushes the credibility of reality in that the cops were there pretty much every night, it seems. And the place had a gambling license, too. And those things are supposed to be hard to get and hard to keep. But this place had hot and cold running crime that you warded in the front and consumed in the back. Now, as far as businesses that have crime in the front of them, Shuey and I have some experience with this on a much lower level. Oh, yes. Much, much lower level. Okay. Yes, much lower. So at Fordham... <laughs> The bodega across the street from the Metro North station, which they opened, but you had to put your money in this little revolving thing that um, 
they would put what you bought in it with your change and then it would turn around and they'd get your money and you'd get your stuff. And, you know, the thing was, that was so you could, couldn't shoot them. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there was no straight shot. Like you could stick it in the little slot thing, but you'd never hit anything. Um, so the thing was, you could order a pack of smokes, a 40, a crazy horse, which is, uh, and a dime bag if you had <laughs> enough money, but you know, that's what would come back out too. Well, isn't that handy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there was probably a lot more you could get, but, you know, we were pussies and didn't want to do that. Um, you know, didn't know what to ask for, even if we, we did. Didn't have enough money, even if, you know, we knew that what to say. So we did our small time crime. We would have been like Dennis and D when they went to buy crack, yeah. and he's like, "How much?" And he's like, yeah. one, one, yeah. one crack rock, please." <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love so, it. hey there, it's Acadia here, and my partner Hannah Selector is going to tell us a little bit about the show we do together. Do you like horror movies? Stephen King, ranting and raving. Join us for a meeting of the Castle Rock Historical Society, Tuesdays, wherever you listen to podcasts. So motels are a great way to cash in on people doing stuff they don't want anyone to know they're doing. When I was in high school, there was a state restaurant stop on my way home, and everybody knew it was where the local gay community would go to hook up at night. Well, this kid I knew's dad owned a motel that was right across the street. Well, eventually, the town pearl clutchers said that the rest area needed to be gated at night. And very soon after, my friend's dad expanded the motel, and all of a sudden, he was busy every night. (laughs) And now that I think about it, maybe he was the one that got the rest area shut down. I may have fucking (laughs) cracked a 30-year-old case. Hey, 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 can we focus here now? I need to know about the story. Yeah, I know, but that's serious business. Like, he, he... Got the rest area shut down, and then all of a sudden he was rich. Exactly. <laughs> that's, just, cl- that's hustling, baby. <laughs> Clever fucker. So, I'll focus. Back to the Boudreaux Inn. The point of this story is that the town, in my story, my personal one, got the rest area closed at night. But while the Boudreaux Inn is closed now, it wasn't while it was in its heyday. Now, I know getting a private business closed is a lot different than a state rest area. The fact that they kept their liquor and gaming licenses is not nothing. And here's another thing tying them together. Every single one of them, all eight of the Jennings eight victims, had been confidential informants for the town or parish police at one point or another. And not only were they informing on other people in the drug trade, they were informing on each other And sometimes they would wind up dead after they did their informing. Mm -mm. I mean, not directly after. And I suppose technically you would have to do all your informing before you died unless you wrote a note or something. So that was kind of stupid. (laughs) (laughs) I am informing from beyond the grave. Anyways, before Mel's yells at me to focus again, these women were intertwined with the cops. Mm. And that means the Jennings cops and the parish cops, because why wouldn't every fucking possible geographical boundary have its own cops? Why does the county still figure so much into our lives? Like, why can't it just be local and state? I'm legit asking because I don't know. Well, that's because sheriffs are elected and police chiefs are appointed, right? Yeah, and they need to have a jail per county, you know, because it would kind of be stupid to have one in every town. Well, <laughs> Those are pretty good fucking answers. Yeah, did that answer your longer, question? <laughs> yes, I asked and answered. I no longer have any questions regarding why there are county sheriffs. <laughs> but I assume if there are other reasons, they are eclipsed by so that they can be portrayed comically in Burt Reynolds movies and like the Dukes of Hazard and shit like that. <laughs> I, see, I watched a Burt Reynolds movie yesterday in which that wasn't funny about that. Oh, really? It was called White Lightning. Huh. Was it about moonshine? Yes. No. And Ned Beatty was a dirty cop. Ooh. See? Dirty it's like we said last week. Nobody fucking questions that a cop would be dirty. Yeah. Right. 
Like it's it's cops and politicians. Like it's complete. No one has to suspend their disbelief. Yeah, no one's like no way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Sorry. If it's a type of role that you could be cast in 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 a production, then that means they don't bat their eyes <laughs> twice at it. I'm sorry, I got of um, course. No, that's all right. It's always good to know about sheriff movies. <laughs> it is. Yeah. At any rate, the inn is another one of those crisscrossings between the victims and the law that seems too much to be a coincidence. Like the fact that Muggy Brown had reportedly told people shortly before her death that she was investigating a murder with a cop. Huh. Or that we already talked about Paula Guillory, who was married to the jail warden, Terry Guillory, who happened to be the cousin of victim number eight. Yeah, he was the cousin, Nicole Guillory. And he was accused on multiple occasions of pimping out these women from the jail. No. Yes. And there's eyewitness accounts of him having sex with the first victim, Loretta Chason, through the cell bars. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Evidently, it was a known thing that you could get better treatment in drugs and cigarettes and shit if you played ball with Guillory. Who, by the way, is still a cop and nothing ever stuck to him. That is disgusting. Yep. I told you this story this was going to make you mad. Is, is this guy married? Do we know if he's married? He was at is one he, point. Is, is he still married to Paula? No, they're divorced, I think. Uh, okay. So. Wow. Uh, it's annoying. That's fucked up. That's fucked up, If you man. ran the jail and these gals were in the jail all the fucking time. For one reason or another, just because of the lifestyle they led. And you can get put in jail for, what, 24 hours without even getting charged? Right. So basically, in theory, he could have had them get arrested for any fucking made up reason. Be in there long enough to do stuff or talk to him or whatever needed to be done. And then get let go, and they would never even see a DA. Now, I don't have any evidence that that happened, but it seems fucking likely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems like something that could happen. So, it seems reasonable to assume that since these cases have been open for as long as 15 years, and the town is fucking tiny that there is incompetence going on at the least and corruption seems more likely. But what was it about? Well, Ethan Brown tracked the owner of the Boudreaux Inn to a guy who happened to work for a Louisiana congressman named Charles Bustani. He had reportedly been seen by multiple witnesses at the inn and had been said to have purchased sex from two or three of the future victims. Now, oh, no. he denied all this when it came out in Ethan Brown book, Ethan Brown's book, but it managed to sink his family values Senate primary campaign. Ironically, he had been in the running for David Vitter's seat, the senator who had to resign because he loves sex workers too much. And it came out. Oh. Isn't it ironic? Yeah. Louisiana just can't stop with the sex workers, I guess. Mm. Can't stop with the corruption. No. Both. Well, yeah, both. They kind of go together, but yes. So this angle is why some think that the Jennings Eight were one of the main inspirations for the original season of True Detective. Because, like we said earlier, there's a bunch of places that have said they were the inspiration, but this tied up to national office seems to elevate things a little bit. Like, if they were killing these girls because they knew that this powerful representative who was running going to run for senate was a degen then they couldn't be trusted to be bought off so they had to get killed mm. in theory i guess now we're in the theories section that's crazy now any thoughts about federal officials being involved in seedy, seedy crack house motels that are filled with sex workers? Well, yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> You'd think it probably would, right? Yeah, I mean, I know in my lifetime I've heard about it a lot. Yeah, I suppose. 
I guess that's just the 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 price you got to pay to have representation in Washington. <laughs> but I'm also from the South. Oh yeah, that's true which too. This is considered the South, so <laughs> you're super corrupt, Mel's. I know. Oh my gosh, that's why I am the way I am. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was because of the frogging. Well, gigging, gigging frogs. Oh, Giggin, yeah, that's sorry. Froggin is actually <laughs> playing the game Frogger, so sorry. Yeah, let's get it right. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna quote it, you gotta get it right, all right? So, <laughs> another theory for why these women were murdered is that it was a drug bust gone wrong in 2005 where a 43-year-old pill dealer named Leonard Crochet got a shotgun blast to the chest for his trouble. Oh, in his own house. The cop said he thought Crochet had a gun, but big surprise, no gun was found anywhere near him. But of course, the cop got off with absolutely nothing happening to him. Fucking kidding me. But I guess he hadn't figured out what a drop piece was because that's what they're for. Yeah. So the problem with this is he wasn't the only one in the house. So were some of the women eventually murdered. And according to Ethan Brown, Frank and Richard told him most of them girls was at a raid when that crochet boy got killed. Most of the girls that are dead today were there that night. Oh, my gosh. He even got the witness list from the raid and said in his medium post. I've obtained a witness list from the Louisiana State Police on the incident. It reads like a who's who of players in the Jeff Davis 8 case, including the third victim, Kristen Gary Lopez. Alvin Bootsy Lewis, the boyfriend of the fourth victim, Whitney Dubois, and the brother-in-law of the first victim, Loretta Lewis. And Harvey Bird Dog Burley, who later told Dubois' older brother, Mike, that I'm close to finding out who killed your sister. And it was then found stabbed to death in this Jennings apartment. Yay. His murder, too remains unsolved okay now bird dog <laughs> isn't this also a term for when you have to poop i <laughs> or am i totally off base with that i just i i don't I thought, i've never been asked bird dogging? if i'm bird dogging well is that how you potty train wrong. okay the little one <laughs> are you bird dogging i mean like i've heard like turtle head poking out but i also thought that bird bird dog and maybe i'm way off course with this and this has nothing to do with with the seriousness of what we're talking about here but as soon as i heard bird dog i was like oh my gosh i wouldn't want my nickname to be i have to shit (laughs) yeah right (laughs) that's terrible that is pretty bad (laughs) Oh, who'd want that? Might as well just call him Harvey Turtle Burley. <laughs> I'm I'm checking Urban Dictionary just because I need to find out. Oh, good. <laughs> Mel has to have created something. Well, new if I did, you're now. all very welcome. <laughs> yeah, none of these are anything to do with poop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, now everybody, you can use this. You can use this slang for. If you got a poop, yeah. it's got a bird dog. Just go in the Urban Dictionary and add it. <laughs> I'll just that. I'll like it. Oh, yeah, that's true, too. Okay. Well, I say that because <laughs> bird dog's point. I have one. Anyway, we can go on with it. Oh, also, if you go on Urban Dictionary and search for Acadia, you will find that I am the top definition. Yep. A pile of poop? And it was oh, no, yeah. and it was added in... 2005 so take that urban dictionary take that second definition <laughs> so oh my word what do you think about this wrongful they murdered the guy in his house and they witnessed it and then told other people who then told two people who then told two people etc which do you think has more credibility it's a deadly game of telephone, I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Was the case like still active when all like you mean what's the timeline well, on this? So the, the drug bust was before the I'm first sorry. murder. The same year, two thousand and five. So and the murders went from two thousand and five to two thousand and nine. It's definitely tied. So got that going for us. Right. And honestly, 
I think that's all I have the fucking stomach for with this case. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the cop who got information so explosive that he went around his own force and sent it to the FBI, but it ended up back in Jennings and he got charged with some bullshit. Oh, so it was like the, uh, I'm not going to apologize for the shit that you found out. I'm going to be mad at the person who leaked it. And it was part of that. um, It was part of those inmates that got interviewed talking about the the truck and and that kind of stuff even though some of it was true but they trumped up a charge that he sexually harassed one of the inmates that he was uh interviewing so that's how they got rid of him and he had sent it directly to the fbi and the fbi fucking sent it back so that'll give you a little taste of and he specifically sent it to him because he knew he couldn't trust the task force wow right i'm not going to talk about the cop that had pertinent info that turned out to be in the fucking clan (laughs) Jesus. Because that's also a thing. I'm not even going to talk about Sheriff Ricky Edwards, who started the multi-agency investigative team, which is what they called the task force. He bumbled along through everything, making excuses. For fuck's sake, he was the sheriff back when they got busted by Dateline, and he had nothing to say then except that if the officers said they were speeding, they were speeding. Even though, as we learned last week, the car physically couldn't speed. <laughs> Mm-mm. So this fucking dink was sheriff until 2011 when he lost to a new guy whose entire campaign was based on solving the murders. Oh, wow. Yes. That was nine years ago. He has solved exactly nothing. And he refused to talk to Ethan Brown on the record at all. And so it goes. Oh, word. The power the cops in this town have, pimping out prisoners, fucking prisoners, threats, murder, bad shoots with no consequences... The only person who got fired was the woman who got caught up in missing evidence. Everyone else was fine. Oh, yeah, they did fire the guy that was in the Klan. Which, to be fair, (laughs) if you find out one of your cops, to be fair, if you find out one of your cops is in the Klan, you probably, but even though he did have an explanation, he basically thought it was like, oh, I just thought it was like a MAGA rally, and then it turned out to be a Klan thing. Oh. But he didn't say MAGA rally. He just thought it was like a gun rights or some shit like that. So I shouldn't I shouldn't cast aspersions. But whatever, he, he still got shit canned. I'm fucking exhausted because we could do another five episodes on this shit pool of a case, but I don't want to. According to the cops who will talk, <laughs> they're getting nowhere because nobody in the town trusts them and won't tell them shit. I wonder why. So, right. there's everything I have about the Jennings 8. There's there's Murder in the Bayou, the Showtime uh, documentary. Investigation Discovery did a documentary on it. So, there's other info that's kind of the same as what I just told you, but, the, you know, a little more in-depth and some more, some more interviews and stuff like that. Because, I mean, these victims had families, and the families knew, like, there was even a... There was even an episode of Dr. Fucking Oz where there was a hairdresser from the town who said that four of the victims were getting their hair done and said, oh, I'm going to get murdered. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Fucking sickening. Like, think about think about knowing that you're going to be on a fucking list like that and not having the, the ability to get the fuck out. To just leave, like, just leave the fucking town. But also, you're telling people too, and no one's seeking help for you. I mean, it's like if someone was sitting in my chair and I was a hairdresser, and they told me that, I would be like, I, "We got to get you some help." I mean, do you see what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, but what's here? the help? Call the cops. Wah, wah. No. I mean, like, get them out of town. Yeah. Get them out of this shithole. Like, help them get a better life. I don't know. I mean, I maybe you've got limited means. I mean, I don't know how I would go about doing that, but I, I would definitely try to help someone. Oh, I think about it every day. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You don't think about how you could just escape and have nobody ever know that you were like alive anymore, basically fake your own death and disappear. That's just me. I've said too much. That <laughs> might just be you. I watch way too much. I watch way too many Datelines and things like yeah, that. That's true for, too. And I would know that I it would take 
not very long for them to figure out that I wasn't really dead. I would do something that would fuck it yeah, all that's up. That's true too. <laughs> like I would, I would fake my death, but keep doing the show. Well, that's right. Like it would be something like that. Well, yeah, no, Katie is not dead. Her, her, her. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking dumbass, I am. So yeah, this was, this was a lot. Yeah. And it fit with the times of, and, and it's not, do I believe that every police force in the country at every level is like just killing sex workers and, and exploiting them and everything like that? No, I absolutely, that's not the point of this whatsoever. The point of this is the cops can do whatever the fuck they want and there's nothing anyone can do about it except for apparently now in Colorado. Mm. And that's what's happening here. If the quote unquote charges get dropped, then you just turned yourself from doing a run in the state prison or going back to the fucking Boudreaux Inn. So which are you going to pick? Yeah. And as soon as the first girl got killed, then all the rest of them were on notice. Because, I mean, this was four years. You know what I should have looked up? I should have looked up, had they solved any murders in since 2005? That would have been a good indication. Like, if they have just sold, they solved zero murders, then they just have really bad detectives. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ugh. Yeah. Well... If you want to talk about all this with us, you can hit me up on Twitter at Acadia or the show Twitter, which is Strangeful Pod. Mel's is Mel's Bells 84, and her Instagram is Superficial Mel's. And Shuey is Shuey Time on Twitter and Insta. So make sure you catch his once a week Instagramming. <laughs> and once a week. Well, yeah. That's only. A- yeah. Uh, it might be left. And Twitter, Twitter's a good once a quarter. Come on. We got to get you in the mix. <laughs> well, I'm getting off of social media other than stuff of the show because it all angers and upsets me. Well, that's because you're talking to – remember I told you about those real-life people that turned out it wasn't just their opinions that were dumb. It was them that were dumb. You're still talking to them. That's the problem. <laughs> I hung. I I kept, I kept on social media till my birthday, so I could get everybody's birthday wishes. <laughs> there you go. That's smart. Now, now I can get off. Then you were like, "Boom, smoke pellet." Exactly. Take that, fuckers. That was good thinking. <laughs> and if you have a minute, please rate and review us on your podcast platform of choice, like Podbean. <laughs> like Podbean. It would really help us get noticed by new listeners, which is how we grow. Not how I grow. I grow by eating. And (laughs) tell your friends, too. I grow by (laughs) drinking Mountain Dews. (laughs) They're delicious. My neighbor is fucking addicted to Mountain Dew. Oh, I mean, it's terrible because I've read that it sticks your insides together, but I can't help it. So I went to the dentist today. Congratulations. And it sounded like she's like, yeah, she goes, I got to tell you, quarantine isn't really great for dental care. And I'm like, why? She's like, yeah, you're not doing so good. Uh, And I felt like going, I'm so fucking depressed. Sometimes I go, who am I going to see? I'm not going to brush my teeth. I don't care. (laughs) But. She had to do the whole scraping thing, and it sounded like fucking Pyramid Head dragging his giant knife Ew. across a concrete. Ew. Bat- oh, yeah, it was bad. Ew. And you probably had blood splatter like a freaking murder scene. Like yep. Dexter. <laughs> yep. But I couldn't see it, so I don't care. <laughs> well. But they couldn't do the little water pick thing. You know, the the... She had to do it the old-fashioned way with the fucking implements. Why? Because your gums were so swollen or something? No, because of the Rona. Oh. oh, oh. I haven't been to the dentist since. It was pretty slick how they did it. Quarantine. Like, you had to wait in your car and text them, and they came out and got you. And then you had to goop up with the sanitizer and 
and uh, the hygienist was all, you know, she had the face shield and all that kind of stuff. So I felt pretty good about it. I didn't feel good about the fact that it felt like she was jamming me in the gums with an ice skate. Oh, but- stop. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> if we've disgusted you enough with the talk of that, and we've made you so disgusted with State of the New World that you want to help us do it even more, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash strangeful. So count your blessings, y'all. Be glad you weren't in the dentist chair. That's right. And thank you to uh, new patron Robin Hood for signing up this week. We appreciate you. Hey, Ooh, welcome. Thank you. And keep on flapping for you, Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.